Hi, this is Burak Baitu from Baitu Realty. We're here today with uh, Mark from Bishop and Sewell. Mark will explain to us what a leasehold is, uh, 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 how the property market in the UK uh, is different from uh, other countries in that respect. Um, uh, Mark, hello, welcome. Hello, hi, hi. Before we uh, dive into the topic, would you like to introduce yourself and your company a bit? Sure. Okay. So my name's Mark Chick. Uh, I'm a senior partner here at Bishop and Sewell in London. That's a central London law firm. Uh, we deal with uh, many sorts of things that uh, your your clients and colleagues are likely to want to, to do. So we, we offer services in corporate, in tax, in employment, uh, family, uh, business immigration, um, and various other things, but specifically property and more specifically residential property and in particular leasehold property. So uh, what I do is I'm the head of the leasehold reform team here. That's all about extending leases uh, and buying your freehold. So that's why I'm here to talk to you today. Leasehold topic, yes. So we're talking to the right person when it comes to leaseholds, and we're going to be uh, discussing how leaseholds and freeholds affect, uh, uh, come into effect in the UK property market, uh, and whether leaseholds are necessarily a bad thing or not. So shall we delve into it now? Absolutely. The, the leasehold concept is a very alien concept to many people that are not from Britain. Um, would you like to explain a little bit what that is, how it is different from a freehold, uh, and then we'll take it from there? Okay, yes, that's right. well, okay, let's start at the beginning then. So, so yes, for those of you unfamiliar with the, the UK as a property jurisdiction, um, England and Wales and Scotland are, are, are treated separately. In Scotland, you can have a freehold uh, within a flat, but in England and Wales, any flat that you look to buy or live in or own is going to be leasehold. And the reason for that is because uh, the way that English property law makes the obligations for repair and maintenance of the property work uh, are under a form of contract that has to be um, enforceable between both parties. So, you know, so the obligation to pay money, the obligation to pay a service charge, all those kinds of things, as the way English property law works, they can only be transferred if the benefit and burden of an existing contract uh, is assigned every time the property is bought and sold. And that contract is a lease. Now, you may well be familiar with the idea of a lease. A lease is a contract to rent a space for a period of time. And many, many jurisdictions have that kind of concept. And indeed, for short term lettings, commercial letting, that's, that's not an unusual thing. But here within the UK, more specifically within England and Wales, it's very normal to have a long lease, a lease of 99 or 125 years. And that device is used to ensure that there's the arrangements for proper maintenance and repair of the property. Now, of course, as, as you may have uh, picked up already, one of the disadvantages of the leasehold system is, of course, that a lease is potentially a wasting asset because, of course, it's an occupation for a fixed period of time. Now, that period of time might be quite long. It might be 99 years. It might be 125 years. It might be 999 years, effectively an infinite term. Um, but the risk is that the lease will get shorter. Now, that is just a function of buying property within the UK. It's something that you can't not do if you like um, but there are various rights and remedies available to people which make this uh, situation a little bit more simple so i suppose the first thing to say is that yes there are leases but no they're not quite as bad as you might first think that they are um, and they are they're there for a good and necessary reason in relation to the shared ownership and maintenance of property um, there has been some talk about reforming the law. There's talk about something called common hold, which is a different system, similar to that which you might find in Australia or New Zealand and other parts of the common law world. And that is something the government is looking to introduce in the medium to long term and probably would be something that would come in for new properties. But right now, at the moment, the lease is the thing if you're buying a flat and it's a long lease. That's the important thing to realise. So it's a... Uh... Uh, it's a lot of information for, for the um, non-British people to digest, but um, I suppose at the end of the day, it's actually not a bad thing that it's a leasehold, so long that the contract for it has been drawn up in a good way uh, for, the, for, the, for the buyers as well. Um, because uh, with the leasehold, you also, my understanding is, um, you also get a property management firm who deals with the property, who maintains it for you. Yes, you pay a certain service charge, but you do pay that when you have a freehold as well. So uh, leasehold is not necessarily a bad thing, I would say, would you agree? I think I would agree with that. So, OK, so as we were saying a moment ago, it's necessary to have some kind of legal relationship between the parties that own the various bits of the property. So if you've got a 
property which is divided into slices, however you want to make it, uh, and it's a block of flats or apartments. There have to, has to be a legal relationship between those entities relating to the maintenance and repair of them. So the lease is a useful device because provided the lease appropriately covers all of the relevant terms, it will deal with maintenance and repair. There's something called a service charge, which is where the, 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 the freeholder, the landlord company, will impose a charge for the common maintenance and repair of the property. So things like the roof, um, you know, the other things that may need fixing over time will belong to the freeholder. So the external parts of the property quite often are held by the freehold owner, who then is entitled to charge the cost of repairing those things back to the leaseholders. Now, whilst on the one hand, you might think, well, that's my property, I'd rather maintain my own little particular slice of the property. Actually, in a way, because if a property is big or sophisticated, it's far better that that is done as a part of a coordinated activity. And therefore, in the UK, particularly in England and Wales, um, property management is, is an industry in itself and an appropriate industry because the collection of the service charge, the repair, the maintenance of property is all dealt with under the terms of the lease itself. And I think you took, touched on a very right point a moment ago, which is to say that it's really important to make sure that the terms of the lease itself are, are appropriate. It's not You shouldn't assume automatically that that's going to be um, you know, correct or right. But of course, that is what you would employ uh, a solicitor to do to, in terms of due diligence when you buy the property, in terms of making sure that the, the terms are appropriate. As it relates to service charge, these charges are variable charges. They are imposed under law. There is there is statutory control over service charges. Service charges have to be reasonable within the meaning of the service charge legislation. And what that means is that there is a tribunal called the first tier tribunal of the property chamber where a dispute about service charges could be taken for determination. So indeed, although leasehold is a one-sided thing, the landlord holds the power to a certain extent, the tenants do have the right, the leaseholders do have the right to challenge some of these things. And the legislation here is pretty friendly as regards the leaseholder. Uh, it's not to say those things are, are necessarily come with, without any cost or it's you know a, a perfect system, but there is a, a fully accountable system in relation to how money can be be collected. Um, so yes, in, in in essence, the leasehold system it clearly works. Uh, the properties are being maintained. Um, you know, you may have seen some other things in the news recently about cladding, for instance, that is something that's caused a lot of heartache, a lot of angst, quite rightly so. Fire safety issues in new built properties are, are particularly concerning. Um, but the principle of service charges themselves are not really a problem. So I think and, and that's, you know, that's the benefit of the leasehold system. Yes, I mean, um, the, the cladding issue is one of the is, is a good example that I always give uh, to my overseas buyers. Um, if you were to deal with that from overseas with no knowledge about cladding. Uh, and also this, you know, cladding is a, is a technicality. It's more or less the same thing in any country, uh, but then the legislation of how you can actually uh, apply that because of, of all the health and safety regulations and this and this and that, you wouldn't want to deal with that as an investor of one flat in one building. Uh, suppose you have many flats in many buildings and you will have to deal with that from overseas with very limited um, knowledge and and making a, a joint decision with many more people that are not any more clued up about the matter. It's a problematic thing. Yeah, I mean, that's an isolated example. Okay, it does affect a lot of some, some new built properties, um, but it's not every single property. It's just a case specific problem. And it's something that the government has known quite a lot about. And obviously, since the tragedy of the Grenfell fire, there's been a lot of inquiry into the use of appropriate and safe materials in relation to, to buildings. There've also been various different remediation schemes that have been put in place by the government, some of which have actually capped or limited the amount that the leaseholders would have to pay towards the cost of maintaining those things. So whilst we can't get into the detailed specifics of that in this discussion, I suppose the, the point to come back to is whoever's advising you, if you're looking at making a property purchase in the UK, and more specifically in England and Wales, um, you know, needs to be a sufficiently expert enough to be able to detect these issues and to advise you in relation to them and to give you appropriate comfort around that. And I, I do appreciate that those things are not necessarily things that are going to be immediately to the fore of somebody's mind if they're not fully familiar with the, the current debates in the UK property system. As this, this is why in the UK system uh, you have 
solicitors involved in a purchase, even if it's actually very close friends or relatives uh, buying one from one another? Uh, because first of all, obviously, a lot of people make purchases with a, with a mortgage and then the mortgage, the lending companies would like to make sure that they're lending money on something that is actually worth that money and, and it doesn't uh, have any risks or the risks are well calculated. Uh, uh, but the second thing is, as a buyer, you don't necessarily know uh, uh any of those about any of those risks you don't know how to assess them so um it's not just the cladding but if any matter would arise once you made the purchase then you're left to your own devices and and obviously as an industry any property management firm uh, will be in a far better position i suppose to to manage that situation on your behalf would you agree? I think that's right. Although I think the other, I think the one thing I would say, which is an important point of emphasis, is that the the, the you know the position here is it's very much buyer beware. So you're buying the property. You, it's up to you to do the due diligence. It's up to you to ask the questions, the inquiries that you need answering for yourself. It's not the other way around. Okay, there might be liability if the seller deliberately uh, is inaccurate about things to do with the property. So it's really important, and certainly uh, in, yeah, in, in England and Wales and in the UK generally. The both sides of a transaction have to be independently represented. It's not the case, as is maybe the case elsewhere in the world, where one person can act for everybody. That does not happen. That cannot happen. And certainly if there's a mortgage involved, that certainly cannot happen either. So the, the bank will require a, a, a solicitor that is on their panel to be able to act for them. And then you yourself as the investor will also have your own requirements, perhaps in relation to the property as well. But if you're using mortgage finance, it's really the bank that's driving the transaction because it's their lending criteria which have to be adhered to. And maybe it's worth saying something about that. There's something called UK Finance PLC. Um, it's a sort of a handbook which all of the lenders subscribe to, which sets out what is and what is not acceptable for lending purposes. And so if you're thinking about buying a property, one of the first questions if you need a mortgage is, well, will it be acceptable for lending purposes? And so, for instance, in relation to leasehold property, one thing that often comes up is lease length, because, of course, um, lease length can be an issue. We said originally about one of the issues of leases, they get shorter. 80 years is a particular watch point in the lifetime of a lease because if the lease slips under 80 years, there is a right to renew, but it will cost more than it would do if the lease had more than 80 years on it. And also, um, if a lease is, say, around about 75 years, typically 50 years plus the mortgage term of 25 years, that can make it much harder to get a mortgage on that property. So if you're buying a property which already has a lease on it that's not a new property and the lease is not particularly long, that could be a barrier to getting mortgage finance. But you do have the legal right to to extend that. That's yes. the thing. Yes, no, I think that's with a lot of costs that you did not originally uh, calculate mm -hmm. factor in when you decided on the purchase, which is obviously not ideal. Which is why you should have uh, always uh, um, uh, a solicitor representing you. Uh, but um, uh, at the end of the day, it's not like. The, the lease term is going to expire and your hands are tied and you're just watching it, uh, in the, watching the numbers, the years go down one by one the, to zero. And then the landlord, the actual land owner uh, taking uh, um, the land away and, and, and demolishing your property. That is not happening. No. So, OK, let's just say a few words about that, because that's really quite important, isn't it? So anyone who buys a leasehold property in the UK, a leasehold flat uh, or England and Wales, um, who's owned it for more than two years, has the legal right to extend that lease by term of 90 years on top of the unexpired term of the existing lease. So you can add on an additional 90 years. That comes at a cost. But that's a legal right. That every single person that's owned a flat for more than two years has. So let's say your lease is currently I don't know, let's say it's now gone to 75 years, let's say, you can add on 90 years, making that 165 years long. And that will solve the problem for your lifetime, pretty much. Obviously, no issue will arise about extending the lease again until the lease gets closer to 80 years. Um, and that fixes the problem. And that new extension of the lease is at, at a zero ground rent. It's also worth mentioning ground rent, I think, at this stage as well. So there's something that you pay under a lease uh, often. It's a few hundred pounds a year, usually. Um, and that goes to the freeholder as pure profit for them, really, uh, just simply because they, they are letting you occupy the land on which the property has been built. Um, but under the new lease, if you extend the lease, that is set at zero. So there's no more ground rent to pay. So the important thing to realise is that for any leasehold property owned for more than two years, there's the right to extend. 
or indeed potentially the right to buy the freehold, although that's a right which exists together with others in the block. So there is quite a lot of scope for self-determination. I think the, the, the politicians uh, in England and Wales over the years have recognised the potential inequality of the leasehold system and therefore have produced legislation which will allow people to redress the balance. And that's something which, which is a, a definite right that you have. So yes, it's true to say a lease is strictly speaking a wasting asset, but in the case of a UK property asset, which is leasehold, there's always the right to extend. Right. And um, uh, providing that the contract has been drawn up, the leasehold contract has been drawn up in a favourable way or in a fair way, put it that way. The fact that a property is a leasehold should not be a deterrent on itself. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, so long the leasehold is a, is a fair leasehold, it shouldn't be a deterrent to anyone uh, deciding to make a purchase in the UK property market. Is that right? No, I think that is right. So I think the thing to say, I mean, if you want to buy a flat in England, uh, you will definitely be buying a leasehold flat. That's how it is. So that, that there is no choice. Can't there. Avoid that. It's not as if there's another option available that's not being offered to you. It, that's, yeah. it, it, it is that there is exactly. there is only leasehold. So that's the important thing to realise. I think it's also worth saying something about the, the terms of the lease itself, because also you, you, if you do some reading on this, you'll see um, that we mentioned ground rent a moment ago. This regular payment that's made to the freeholder, it's not the service charge, that's the cost of maintenance. This is a payment for simply the freeholder owning the building itself, if you like, the landowner collecting money from you. Um, if it's a few hundred pounds a year, that's not a problem at all. But unfortunately, what happened a few years ago is that some of the freeholders, particularly in new build developments, um, got a bit clever and decided to impose terms that were, weren't particularly fair. So the ground rent went up at quite alarming rates. Now, ground rent payments typically and historically have doubled at, let's say, 25 year intervals to keep pace with inflation. So a rent that's maybe one or 200 pounds a year doubling every 25 years is not going to be particularly onerous. That's unlikely to cause a problem. But what has been done in the past, unfortunately, is that people have written clauses in where the, le where the lease rent doubles, say, at 10 year or even less intervals, and the rent's quite high. So it goes from £500 to, say, £1,000 to £2,000 to £4,000, this compounded doubling um, at short intervals. Now, that would be potentially a problem. Now, that's something the mortgage lenders would be wanting to pick up on. It's something a competent solicitor or surveyor would pick up on. And ultimately, I suppose it's also worth pointing out, we've said already that somebody looking to buy a property would be well advised to use a lawyer that knows what they're talking about, definitely. But more importantly as well, it's, it's important that they perhaps also take appropriate valuation advice from a surveyor. So there are plenty of websites you can go to. One of them is the ALEP website. That's the Association of Lease Sold and Franchisement Practitioners. Um, you can look there. You can find the names of suitable practitioners who are sufficiently expert in lease sold to be able to assist it, it, with, with you uh, in doing this work. And anyone you approach, obviously, they should be able to give you some appropriate guidance around this. It's important to make sure you have appropriate help in, in working out what you're doing. And, and suppose you have bought a, a, a development uh, that has uh, 250 years old uh, lease, uh, but then you have the option to upgrade. You've been you've been given that option by uh, the developer or the landlord, uh, and um, you pay a, a, a certain fee for that. But it it uh, raises to the lease to, to 999 years, and there's no longer going to be a ground rent. It will be peppercorn zero. Um, uh, so. In that sort of situation, uh, this is a new situation, I suppose, in, in the UK market. Uh, um, but uh, what, is, what are your thoughts on that? And would you, in general terms, obviously, case by it needs to be handled case by case. And as we've already uh, discussed, that the actual lease term and the way it's worded is very important. But in general uh, terms speaking, what would you say to people that have the option to upgrade? Uh, how do you think the lenders market also over time will react to this new, uh, well, to this dual system, I will say, mm -hmm. uh, now that we're going to well, be... Well, okay, so I think that to answer the first question first, so would you go for an upgrade if you're offered the answer, chance to go to 999 years or 999 years with a zero ground rent? All other things being equal, the answer would be yes, that would be a very good move because that's a virtual freehold interest. That lease is more likely to outlive the, the lifetime of the building. So the answer to that is yes. The question is, what is the cost of that? Now, providing the cost is fair and reasonable, 
and that's only that's an investment decision that's one that would need to be looked at in the you know case specific example of, of a particular case but if it's a few thousand pounds then probably that makes a lot of sense um so you know that's something that that you know would generally be a good thing and I think it's also worth perhaps mentioning um, what might happen in the future so the government is looking at reforming the law in relation to leasehold and in general looking at reforming the law in favour of leaseholders and one of the things that has been discussed is making these leases 990 years long so when you get an extension rather than adding on 90 years you'd add on 990 years which of course is a, is a much bigger benefit um, that benefit would come with a cost, but the cost of doing so wouldn't be that significant compared to adding on 90 years. Because, of course, when you think about a lease, the bit that you're adding on immediately after the end of the term of the lease is the most expensive bit. The bit in the far flung future has a, has a, has a value, but it's much more nominal because it's far further and remote from where you are. So, yes, the short, the short answer is if you're offered, offered, offered an upgrade and it's a good deal, then it would be a good thing to do. Right. I suppose um, uh, if we wrap it up, um, uh, basically for uh, international buyers, overseas investors into the UK property market, which is what Byte Realty uh, is dealing with most mm -hmm. of the time, um, it is uh, what they should know is basically that if you're going for a uh, an apartment flat, it will be a leasehold. So uh, being uh, the fact that it's a leasehold should not be a deterrent. Um, you should look at the terms of the lease and and how many more years you've got on the lease i think that is the, the 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 defining that should be the defining factor for any investor not the fact that it's not a freehold because it will chances are it will not yeah. be freehold if it's an apartment right if it's a new apartment absolutely yes that's right yeah yeah so, but you uh, might buy, you might buy into an established building where people have bought the freehold themselves and if that's the case, you could be buying a flat on a lease and a share in a company that owns the freehold. That is another possibility. But for most new build properties, it's probably just the lease you will be buying. Yes. Uh, so uh, I think that's that's key because the, the concept, uh, uh, people have difficulty understanding this concept. I think it, 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 one of the reasons to that is, uh, for example, with the Turkish uh, buyers, I know that for fact um, that uh, the, the, the term lease and rent have been translated what would be the word of, for rent. OK, so, right. Uh, yeah. It's basically when, when you say lease in Turkey, you're saying rent. And when you mm -hmm. say rent, you say rent. So people automatically tend to think that you're actually mm -hmm. not buying, you're renting the property, which causes a lot of uh, confusion, obviously. Uh, but um, as we've already said, um, you, if someone is making a decision about buying a property in the UK, they should look at the specifics of that uh, op uh, proposition and not, uh, and the the. the um, the fact that it's a leasehold should not be a deterrent because if it, if they say that it's not a leasehold, then there is a problem. Chances are there's, there's some, the information that, be, that is being passed on may not be exactly uh, correct. So, and, and uh, if you have the option to extend it, then again, look at the terms uh, mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the extension, uh, but then it, it may be a good thing because over time, uh, we don't know, uh, I suppose you'd say you don't know either how the lenders will react over time, whether they will find it more preferable in 10 years, 15 years time that you have an extended lease uh, or not. So I think uh, it's well worth doing it if, if, if the in terms mm -hmm. of doing it is right. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair to say. I mean, if the reforms were to come in in that way, then there'd be a lot more 990-year leases around. Let's just put it that way, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And from an outside point of view, if you've got two flats of equal standing, but one is on a 990-year lease, 99-year lease, and one is on a 125-year lease, then presumably the 999-year lease is more attractive. So that is a marketability point. Exactly, exactly. Well, well, thank you very much. Is there anything else that you think uh, under the topic of leaseholds and freeholds we should be covering? Well, I think there's a couple of things, one of which is service charge potentially. So you mentioned we mentioned those during the course of the conversation earlier on. So there's an ongoing cost of maintenance. And I think that's just a question of, of due, due diligence on the particular property you're buying. So you will expect to pay costs towards the maintenance of the property. With hard, It's harder with new property to estimate what those costs will be. But you can make appropriate inquiries. And particularly if the building's been up for a while, there will be information available about that. And that's something you need to factor into your long term cost of ownership. But it's just I mean, you'd have to pay to maintain any property, whether it be freehold or leasehold. So it is just something that an investor needs to consider. Apart from that, really, no, I think it's just keeping your eyes and ears open, making sure 
you get appropriate advice um, and understanding the nature of the tenure. And it's something that's, you know, it's particular to the to the UK, particularly to England and Wales, but it, it's something that, that you know, is, is freely transactable here. And it's the normal way of owning these kind of properties. Right. Well, um, Mark, thank you very much for all the uh, information you provided on the topic of leasehold. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, our viewers will really find that very informative. Uh, it's, it's a matter that, uh, that everybody talks about and everybody thinks that they know a lot about. But uh, most of it, I can, uh, in my experience over the years in this industry, uh, a lot of people from overseas uh, tend to know the terminology but actually not what stands behind the terminology. And there's a lot of hearsay about that. So hopefully with this uh, recording, we've been able to address uh, some of those topics and put it right. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for your time and all the information. And uh, hopefully soon we'll cover a few more uh, uh, topics with you again. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, take care. Thank you, thank you.